Sometimes I think What will people say of me When I'm only just a memory When I'm home where my soul belongs Was I love When no one else would show up Was I Jesus to the least of us Was my worship more than just a song I wanna live like that and give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, then this is where I I prove that you are who you say you are, that grace can really change a heart. Do I live like your love is true? People pass, and even if they don't know my name, is there evidence that I've been changed? Well, good evening, and thank you for joining me. This is Pastor Ryan coming to you from First Baptist Church of Hillsville. Uh, thank you for joining us for session five now in our Bible study series, Bible Reading 101. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the Gospels, uh, which is obviously a, a very important genre for us as Christians. But before we dive into it, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just invite you to come alongside us this evening. Open our hearts and minds to hear your word, to, to learn how to study and understand your word, maybe just a little bit better, Father, so that we can learn more about who you are, about what Jesus has done, and about our inheritance with you in eternal life. So Lord, we just ask that you would bless our time together, bless those who are in need this, this evening as well, give them peace and healing and comfort, and Father, we just pray that whether it is in that kind of healing, or whether it's in our Bible reading or prayer, Father, that you would be glorified in everything that we think, say, and do. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark 4. We're going to be hanging out there for a good portion of tonight as we look at the Gospels. The two books that I've been pulling predominantly from, hopefully are up on your screen right now, um, one of them, Grasping God's Word by Duval and Hayes, uh, on their chapter on the Gospels, it begins with this quote, At the very center of our faith stands a person, Jesus Christ. He performed miracles and spoke the very words of eternal life. That's taken from John 6, 68. The, the life of Jesus Christ, if anyone ever had a full life, uh, especially one that was ended so early, it was Jesus uh, he did. He performed miracles, a, a ton of miracles from what we can gather. And he did speak the very words of eternal life. He preached and he taught and he discipled and mentored 
uh, and engaged people and changed people's lives. One thing Jesus didn't do was publish an autobiography about himself. So how do we know anything about him? You know, it's, it's become fashionable to question the his- historical existence of a man named Jesus of Nazareth. But questioning his existence doesn't come from unbiased academic historians, not even atheist ones. Uh, there's simply too much extra-biblical evidence to credibly claim that the man never existed. And, and if you hear this talked about, it's often referred to as the Christ myth. Uh, it's, it's this idea that Jesus the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, historically never even existed. So I just want to start by giving you a few examples, and these really are just a few examples of extra-biblical and often pagan sources that refer to Jesus Christ. Uh, Cornelius Tacitus was one. He was a noted first century Roman historian. He mentioned Christ. He called him Christus. Uh, Other sources sometimes called him Crestus and his followers. And he even alluded to an early belief in his resurrection. Lucian of Samosata was a Greek satirist and uh, certainly very antagonistic uh, and condescending towards the early Christians. But in the latter half of the second century, He spoke scornfully of Christ and his followers, but he spoke of them as being real. Pliny the Younger, in the early 2nd century, uh, he wrote to the emperor Trajan to ask about killing Christians. His question was, do I kill some of them or do I kill all of them? He speaks of Christ as the founder of his Christian followers. Thallus, another historian who wrote around A.D. 52, so very close to the time of Christ. Uh, Only fragments remain of his original work, but other early writers refer to his writings. And an example of this, the the Christian writer Julius Africanus, uh, and again, that was in A.D. 221, but looking back, referring back to this guy who wrote around A.D. 52, he refers to Thallus' mention of darkness that fell across the land on the afternoon of Jesus' crucifixion, which he writes off to a solar eclipse. And Julius is writing, he's refuting that because the crucifixion took place at the time of the full moon, the paschal moon. And so a solar eclipse could not explain that occurrence. That's kind of the context of what he's writing in. Nevertheless, he's referring to Thallus in AD 52, making mention of that darkness that fell across the land on the day of Jesus' crucifixion uh, in the afternoon. Another guy, Mara Bar Serapion, around AD 70, he was a Syrian, a Stoic, and his writing alludes to the wise king of the Jews who was unjustly put to death. Again, these are all writing uh, not as mythological uh, mentions, but as historical mentions of someone who lived Even Jewish non-Christian sources allude to Jesus' existence. The Babylonian Talmud uh, speaks of hanging Yeshu, Yeshu is Jesus, on the eve of Passover. And one version of that particular text calls him Yeshu the Nazarene. And hanged is another way of referring to crucifixion. They were were hung up on the tree. Uh, That was crucifixion. And Josephus, Flavius Josephus uh, was his Roman name. He was a Jewish historian There's some question and debate as to whether or not he was kind of a closet Christian because of what he wrote. Um, Nevertheless, in the first century AD, in his his work, Jewish Antiquities, he writes that a man named Jesus performed many miracles, taught truth, was the Christ, was condemned by Pilate to die by crucifixion, and that he appeared three days later to his followers as foretold. That was a Jewish source. So again, this is just a handful, it's not an exhaustive list, but there is certainly enough information from sources outside the New Testament to know that he really existed. But with that being said, our most direct witness comes from the four canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those four books make up almost half of the entire New Testament. And together, these four writers provide something similar uh, 
to a biography of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. All right, so let's dive into it here. What are the Gospels? Why is this a separate genre that we're talking about? The term gospel, many of you know, translates the Greek word evangelion, which means good news. Gospel writers, because of this, are sometimes referred to as the evangelists. Prior to the New Testament, that word evangelion usually referred to good news that was related to a political or a military victory. But in the New Testament, the word denotes good news either proclaimed by Jesus or good news about Jesus. Gospels are stories. They're interesting. They capture our attention. They, they draw us in. They pull us in. And, and they get us to engage our imagination to visualize what's going on. Because of all that, they're powerful. Stories are powerful. What kind of stories are they? They're stories of Jesus that were drawn from the personal experiences of the apostles. And even though they are biographies, they're different from modern biographies. They're ancient biographies, and they follow a different set of rules than what we're used to. Unlike modern biographies, they don't cover the whole life of Jesus. They jump from his birth to his public ministry. And they spend a disproportionate amount of time on the last week of Jesus' life, which is his death. Um, that was a pretty common practice for ancient biographies because in their minds, the way a person dies says a lot about the person. <laughs> and I don't think that statement could be any more true of someone than Jesus. We don't find anything like a, a detailed psychological analysis of Jesus or any of the main characters. We don't see that like we see in modern biographies. And what we do see is that it includes stories and sayings that have been selected and arranged by the author to tell the audience something important, um, important about the character. All four Gospels essentially tell the same story. But some details vary from gospel to gospel. There are really four different versions of one story of Jesus, which you would expect coming from different sources and different people. There's often some variation in the order of events as presented in the first three gospels. The, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, are the synoptic gospels, which pretty much just means they're seen together. Um, they're all very similar. John... Oftentimes, he just goes a, a whole different route altogether. He, he's got a different purpose and meaning. So if there's variation in order of events, is that cause for concern? No, it's not cause for concern. We recognize that gospel writers, like any reporter or historian, they couldn't tell all that there was to tell about Jesus. John admits as much at the end of his gospel. In verse, uh, or chapter 21, verse 25, John says, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's just a very colorful, prosaic way of John saying, man, he did way more stuff than we had the time and the scroll space to write up. Okay, we tried to give you the highlights. We, we, we had a purpose. If you think about it too, um, if you've ever read through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, how long did it take you to read through those few chapters of the Sermon on the Mount? Probably a matter of minutes, just a handful of minutes. But Jesus, we know, often spoke to crowds for hours at a time. There's just not enough time or scroll space to tell the whole story. So the result is that under, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, Gospel writers chose what to include and what to omit and how to arrange it in a way that effectively communicated the good news to their readers. And as ancient biographers, the gospel writers felt free to paraphrase or summarize what Jesus said and to arrange events according to a certain theme rather than according to strict chronological sequence. The goal of the gospel writers is to tell the story of Jesus in a faithful yet relevant way 
and a persuasive manner for their readers. And once we realize that the evangelists were operating under those ancient rules rather than our modern literary rules, a lot of those so-called discrepancies between the Gospels disappear. A good example of that, the order of the second and third temptations of Jesus. Uh, In Matthew, a central theme in Matthew is the kingdom of God. It makes sense that he would end his account of the temptations with Jesus seeing all of the kingdoms of the world. That's Matthew 4, 8 through 10. But for Luke, Jerusalem figures prominently in his writing. So you can understand why Luke wants to conclude with Jesus being tempted to jump off the temple in Jerusalem. That's Luke 4, 9 through 12. Matthew and Luke tell the story, the same story, they tell it differently, in order to drive home theological points. And I might add that the theological points they're driving home are not contradictory either. So, Gospels are ancient biographies, they're not modern biographies, but they're not just ancient biographies, they are Christ-centered biographies. We would call them Christological biographies if we wanted to give them a fancy seminary name. They're not simply recording historical facts. They have a purpose. Tell the story of Jesus, and through that story of Jesus, teach something important about the person and the mission of Jesus. So they have a purpose in what they're trying to do. All right, so this is Bible Reading 101. Now that we understand what Gospels are, how do we interpret the Gospels? How do we understand what's being communicated? All right, gospel writers selected and arranged their material about Christ to communicate theological truth to their audience. In each episode, they're saying something about Jesus, and they're saying something by the way they link the smaller stories together to form the larger story. So that's the two things we're going to look at uh, through the rest of our time. So that gives us two simple interpretive questions that we want to keep in mind. What does this particular story tell us about Jesus? And what's the gospel writer trying to say to his readers by the way he puts all those smaller stories together into one episode, and into one group series, uh, if you will? So let's start with the individual stories. How do we read those? All right, now if, if you've gotten ahead and you did what I asked you to when we started, you're already at Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter 4. Let's take a look at, the, at an example story of Jesus calming the storm. It starts in verse 35. It says this, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? All right. I keep referring back to your high school English class, and and this is no different. We want to ask the standard questions that we ask of any story. If if you've ever done journalism or anything like that, there's questions. The the W's, who, what, when, where, why, how. So let's do that real quick. Who? Who are the characters? We've got Jesus. We've got the disciples. We've got the crowd. What? What's the storyline? Uh, Verse 37, while crossing the sea, a storm comes up, the waves nearly swamp the boat. Verse 38, the disciples wake Jesus, who's sleeping on a cushion in the stern of the boat. Verses 39 and 40, Jesus rebukes the storm, then rebukes the disciples for a lack of faith. Verse 41, disciples are terrified by Jesus' authority over the sea and ask, who is this? That's pretty much what happens, right? That's, That's all the action going on in the story. When? Well, when evening comes is what it says. Verse 35, disciples and Jesus begin to cross the sea. Verse 38, during the storm. And what happens during the storm? Well, this is notable. Jesus, the carpenter, sleeps. 
But everybody else, the fishermen who should be used to this, the disciples, they fear for their lives. Verse 39, after Jesus rebukes the wind, the sea grows calm. After calming the storm, verse 40, Jesus questions his disciples. Verse 41, after the calming of the storm and Jesus questioning his disciples, the disciples are terrified. Where? Where did all this take place? Well, verse 35, they're heading to the other side of the sea. Verse 36, they're in a boat. Verse 37, waves are breaking over the boat. Verse 38, Jesus is in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. That was pretty easy. So far, none of this has been very complicated. We're just kind of paying attention to details and what's going on. Why? All right, now we're starting to starting to dig into it. Why? What's the reason things are happening in our little story? Verse 38, the disciples wake Jesus. Why? Because they're angry at their teacher's indifference to their safety. Verses 39 and 40, the wind and the waves were calmed. Why? Because of Jesus' rebuke. Verse 40 and 41, the disciples are terrified. Why? Well, initially because of the storm. And to end the story, because they realize that Jesus has authority over the sea. Last question, how? What are the means that the things in the story takes place? What's the method? Verse 38, the disciples, this is going to be interesting, the disciples use a question to rebuke Jesus. Verse 39, Jesus calms the sea by a spoken word. That's how he calms it. He speaks. Verse 40, Jesus uses questions to rebuke the disciples. We've got two things with questions now. Verse 41, the disciples verbalize their fear in the form of a question about Jesus' identity. Who is this? All right, so we take all that now. We've paid attention to the details of the story. We think we know what's going on, why it's going on, where it's going on, how it's going on, who's doing it. All those kinds of things. Now we just want to make some observations. What, what can we pull out of this? Um, both Jesus and the disciples appear in nearly every verse. So it's, it's kind of reasonable to assume that the story focuses on Jesus' relationship with his disciples. What is he trying to teach him? That might be a question we want to ask. Will they learn the lesson? Mm-hmm. Judging from past history with the disciples, probably not. Uh, let's see, Um, we can contrast Jesus's response to the storm with the the, the disciples' response to the storm. We see the difference between faith and fear. We notice the power of Jesus's spoken word. Even the stormy sea is subject to him. And we notice, too, the role of questions in all this. The disciples question Jesus' identity. Jesus questions the disciples' lack of faith. Jesus uses questions to get the disciples to think. All right, now that we've made those observations, we're going to begin to look for interpretive questions from the author himself. Is the author giving us clues to what he wants us to understand in this? And, and normally that's the case. So the first thing we'll, sit, we'll look at is that the author may offer clues in the story's introduction, just right from the get-go. A good example of this, Luke 14, 7. Here's what it reads. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. It's easy to guess just from reading that introductory verse, that the parable is going to have something to do with spiritual pride or humility or or both, maybe. All right? Just by paying attention to that first verse. A lot of times, an author's interpretive clue is going to appear in the conclusion to the story, and that's what happens in ours. Mark 4, the story climaxes with the disciples' question in the final verse. Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Mark wants his readers to realize that Jesus is not an ordinary rabbi. He even possesses divine authority over the wind and the sea. And then another example of this, uh, the story of the rich young man, Matthew 19. The very last line of that story reads this way, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Jesus is turning the world's values upside down. Those who 
who had given everything to follow Jesus shouldn't worry. They will indeed be first in God's kingdom. So sometimes the clues are at the beginning. Sometimes the clues are at the end. Occasionally, the gospel writer is going to include a parenthetical remark to clarify the intended meaning of the story. What do I mean by that? Uh, In Mark chapter 7, uh, the first 23 verses, Jesus confronts the Pharisees and the teachers of the law over an issue of ritual purity. And Mark, right in the middle, adds these words, actually in parentheses, thus he declared all foods clean. By doing this, Mark is drawing out and making it clear what the implication of the story is for his readers. What makes a person clean or unclean is a matter of the heart, not the digestive tract. Okay? There's almost always going to be some clue as to how, how and what the author is trying to communicate to you, the reader. We've mentioned this before because it's the case in multiple genres. Take special note of anything that's repeated in the story. Stories often use repetition to convey theological truth. John 15, uh, if you read John 15, the words remain or abide appear over and over and over again. That's the focus. Matthew 23, you'll read it repeated, woe, woe, woe is, woe is. It conveys an unmistakable tone of warning to the reader. Matthew 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus repeatedly highlights the differentness of his teaching with, you have heard that it was said, but I say, but I tell you. And he repeats that over and over again. Why? Because that's driving home the theological points that he's trying to make. We should also be alert for places where the story shifts from the the action in the scene to direct discourse, to the actual spoken words of somebody. When the characters speak directly, when their words appear in quotation marks in the text, that's a sign for us. And it's interesting, too, by, by isolating the direct discourse only. If you clear everything else out and just focus on what's being said, a lot of times you can actually see the heart of the story. And that's the case, I think, for us in Mark 4 with calming the storm. Here it is. This, is. this is simply the discourse and nothing else. Let us go across to the other side. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Peace, be still. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? We've kind of gotten the gist of everything just by looking at the discourse. And when you put the rest of the scene with it, it just becomes that much more powerful. Uh, the, the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman is another great example of this discourse. So if you want me to give you homework, here's your homework. Go back and read that one and focus on the dialogue. Uh, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Direct discourse generally offers a, an exceptionally clear window for gazing at the theological message of the story. So taking all of that that we've been talking about with Mark 4, taking it all into consideration, we can summarize the story of Jesus calming the storm maybe this way. Jesus exerts his power over the sea and responds to the storm himself by trusting the Father during a difficult circumstance. That's pretty simple, right? All right, so that's what we have for Jesus calming the storm. But that's not the end of it. This occurs as a section with other things going on around it. Um, maybe this is a good time to remind you that when the Bible was originally written, there were no chapters, there were no verses, there were no headings. Uh, Everything just kind of was written together. And so we have to take note of all the surrounding context in order to figure out uh, why there are certain breaks where there are, what we need to read together and piece together. When we read a series of stories, we're trying to answer the question, what is the gospel writer trying to say by the way he strings together those individual stories? He put them together for a purpose. What is it? The guideline here, the most important thing to do when reading a series of stories is to look for connections. That's how we know they go together. The the author will give us connections that are clues that these things go together. Look for common themes or patterns within the writing. Look for logical connections like cause and effect. Notice how the stories differ at key points. That can be a a sure sign that 
we're moving on, and this is now a separate section. Compare the characters. And when you compare the characters, play, pay close attention to Jesus, who is always the main character in the Gospels. Focus on his identity, his mission, his teaching, and also the responses of others to him. And just like in our Mark 4 story, you know, we want to look at how Jesus responds to the storm in contrast to how the disciples respond to the storm. That'll, that'll tell us something. So let's search for connections between our Mark 4, Jesus calms the storm story, and the surrounding text. What comes before it? Before this text, there's a large section of parables by the lake, parables that Jesus is telling while he's by the lake. And we know that by looking at 4.1. It's set off by mentions of him using parables in 4.2 and in 4.33 and 34. That sets that section off, 1 through 34, as a unit of text, as, a, as an episode in and of itself. And in 435, the parables have stopped, and the scene changes from beside the lake to where we are, on the lake. The audience has also changed. Now it's not the crowd, it's the disciples. And those changes show us that a new unit is likely starting in Mark 35 of our story. Now, for most of us that have modern Bibles, these different sections often have their own section headings. Again, that's not biblical text. That's something a translator adds to help us understand what's going on. And if you compare different versions of the Bible, you will quite often see differences in how translators have decided to split up blocks of text. So, that's why it's important not to solely rely on that, but to be able to use the context around to figure out what needs to be going together uh, and what shows a break. So we have a new unit that's starting in Mark 4.35 uh, with our story. What comes after our story? All right. So if we're in Mark 4.35 through 41, we have Jesus exerts his power over the sea and responds with faith during a difficult circumstance. That's our story. What comes next, right after it, Mark 5, 1 through 20? If we ran through the exact same exercise with that section of text that we just spent all that time doing with our story, we'd come up with this. Jesus casts out a legion of demons, he restores a man to his right mind, and he sends him out as a faithful follower. Cool? Mark 5, 21 through 43, we've got two things going on here, and they, they kind of cross over, so I'm going to lump them together. Jesus heals the woman with the hemorrhage, who, because of faith, touched him, then confessed him publicly, and she was healed. And Jesus raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead in the presence of Peter, James, John, and the girl's parents. So two things there. The, the woman who had been hemorrhaging was healed, and Jesus raised a dead little girl back to life. So if we look for connections between all these episodes... We notice several common themes. First, life is hard. People experience the threat of death and satanic attack, disease. Uh, all those things are part of life for people. Life is hard. We also notice Jesus is sovereign over forces that are hostile to God. First century people feared a lot of the same things that we fear. Uh, the sea, the demonic, disease, death. Jesus has power over all those things in our episodes here. We should trust Jesus in the midst of the desperate situations of life. Water was threatening to swamp the boat. The demoniac could not be restrained. Nobody could control him. The bleeding of the woman who was hemorrhaging had lasted 12 years. The daughter was dead. Those are hopeless situations. That's another common thread running through the entire section. Hopelessness in the situation. Jesus calls us to faith. He scolds the disciples for failing to have faith in the midst of the storm. He commends the woman with the hemorrhage for her saving faith, and he tells Jairus not to fear, but to believe, to have faith. So, what is Mark's overall message in this group to his first century audience and to us? That's, that's what we wanted to find by putting all these together. Through his mighty works, Jesus shows himself sovereign 
over the forces that are hostile to God. Good one. Demons, disease, and death strike fear and hopelessness into the hearts of people. Man, we don't change. Mark's first century readers were facing persecution and hostility. Uh, we may not be able to fully identify with them. We know that's where they're coming from. Uh, we may have days of that ahead of us, but we do have brothers and sisters all around the world who face persecution and hostility on a daily basis. Through this series of stories, Mark assures them that Jesus has power over everything they fear. He can calm the sea, he can cast out demons, he can heal diseases, and he can raise the dead. And they should trust him in the midst of the desperate situations of life. Now, for our story in particular, if we, if we view it in isolation, Jesus calming the storm, uh, a lot of times that just gets transferred to being a metaphor that Jesus can calm the storms of your life. And I got to be honest, if, if you read it together as a group, that is the point that comes out of it. But in our story, it's very specifically Jesus can calm the storm. Should we not have faith in a God who has control and ability to stop the wind and the waves? Of course, a God with that kind of power has the ability to calm the, the metaphorical storms in our lives as well, but he can actually calm the storms. So I hope that you can take the lesson given here by Mark uh, and translate it into our current coronavirus situation. That's a, a pretty straightforward um, jump right there. So I'm going to leave that with you guys to, to piece together on your own. He can calm the sea. He can cast out demons. He can heal diseases. He can raise the dead. Trust him in the midst of the desperate situations of life. All right. Applying the message of the Gospels. This is why we read them to begin with, right? We want to understand Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and we want to apply something to our life. The question is, how does this work in real life? Now that we've figured out the principles, the message, the point of what the author is trying to get across to us, how does it impact our life? How does it work in real life? Always, always, always keep the larger context in view. Saying that Jesus has power over hostile forces does not guarantee that he will always deliver us from cancer or car wrecks or coronavirus. But we should trust Jesus in the midst of desperate situations in life. But the rest of Scripture and all of history make it clear that his deliverance can take different forms. Sometimes he delivers us from immediate danger by prevention or by healing. At other times, he delivers us from ultimate danger by resurrection from the dead. When Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom, Paul had to have been speaking about ultimate and final deliverance because he himself died a martyr's death. This is why we need to consult the biblical map. This is step four of our interpretive journey. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'd strongly encourage you to go back and watch session one. Um, this is why we need to consult the biblical map after identifying the theological principle so that we can apply the message responsibly. We don't want to run around telling people that if you believe in God, he will heal you and cure you of everything you have. That's not true, and God never promises us that. So we don't want to irresponsibly apply principles. Christians should not expect to be exempt from difficult situations like disease or death. That's never promised. So if we've decided that the stories say that Jesus is sovereign over hostile forces, and he did calm the, st calm the storm for the disciples, then why didn't he calm the storm for us or for our friends or for somebody that we know that went through a difficult time. Again, we have to return to the larger context. Even while he was on earth, Jesus didn't heal every single sick person or raise every single dead person. We assume that even Jairus' daughter, who he brought back to life, she died again eventually. The first readers of Mark's gospel were facing intense hostility associated with living faithfully in a fallen world. So when Mark communicates that Jesus is sovereign over forces hostile to God, 
it appears that he intends for his audience to understand this in the ultimate sense. Jesus' miracles are a preview of what is to come, glimpses of what it will be like when his kingdom comes in all of its fullness at his return. And that takes us to our, our third principle that we looked at, faith in Jesus. When we speak of faith, we're speaking about a wholehearted trust in Jesus. Faith means hanging on to Jesus even when the immediate circumstances look bleak, when they look hopeless. Whether the deliverance is immediate or it's ultimate, we should have faith in Jesus because Jesus has been, is, and always will be faithful to us. So before we close our discussion of the Gospels, that, that kind of hopefully gives you a, an outline in your mind about how to approach the Gospel stories, how to piece them together. I, I want to kind of offer one final word about something to keep in mind when you're reading and interpreting the Gospels. We've already had a session that touched on, well, actually we had one specifically about parables. We've briefly touched on metaphors and similes, hyperbole, exaggeration that Jesus uses often. But I want to mention the, the teachings and the imperatives included in Jesus's words in the Gospels, because that's something I think that a lot of people uh, easily become confused by. Uh, because a lot of Jesus's imperatives are set in the context of expounding Old Testament law. Think back to what we said about the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. You have heard that it was said a lot of times as referring to either an Old Testament law or how the Pharisees were now mistakenly applying Old Testament law. Either way, it's kind of talking about law. And because you know, a lot of people, when they read, but I tell you from Jesus, it seems to present an impossible ideal. So a lot of people over the years have tried to find ways to interpret around those things as being authoritative. A lot of these efforts came about simply because the imperatives seem like law. Um, and, and it is an impossible law at that. And Christian life, according to the New Testament, is based on God's grace, not on obedience to law. So now we're stuck trying to make sense of these things in our minds. So hopefully this will do that for you. Uh, to see the imperatives as law is to misunderstand them. It's not what they are. They're not law in the sense that one must obey them in order to become or remain a Christian. Our salvation does not depend on perfect obedience to them. Instead, they're, they're descriptions by way of imperative of what Christian life should be like because of God's prior acceptance of us. For example, Sermon on the Mount, look at Matthew 5, 38 through 42. A, a no retaliation ethic is in fact the ethic of the kingdom for this present age. But it is based on God's non-retaliatory love for us. And in the kingdom, it is like father, like son, or like father, like daughter. Um, that's the way he is with us, and therefore, we should be that way as well. It's, it's our experience of God's unconditional, unlimited love and forgiveness that comes first, but it's to be followed by our unconditional, unlimited love and forgiveness to others. So Jesus' imperatives are not law. When you come across them, when you read them, they're not law, but they are certainly a word for us. They describe the lived out love of our new life as God's loved and redeemed children. And uh, uh, that love is not optional, of course. So I hope that that shed some light on the gospels for you. Hopefully it'll give you a, a deeper, richer meaning and, and better ability to kind of piece together the thoughts and the meaning and the purpose behind what the gospel authors are trying to tell us uh, in each of the stories and how they put them all together. So thank you for joining us this evening for session five on the Gospels in our Bible Reading 101 series. Uh, we do have a, a slide for you here that we've added in order to show you all the different ways now that we are trying to get the word out, get the message out, not only to our congregation, um, but in this day and age, uh, we are blessed to be able to get the message out uh, to our congregation, to our community, throughout the state and really around the world.
Um, if, if you want to play a really fun game of the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, we can see how far we can get the gospel message shared around the world just by the friends and the contacts that you have on Facebook uh, and using them to uh, show them ways they can tap into how we're teaching what we're teaching and ultimately to God's Word. So uh, I would definitely ask that if you watch this video that you would just leave us a like or a comment to let us know that you were here uh, and to let others know that you're engaged and give us a, a feeling and spirit of fellowship. Um, but also, I just, I just pray that this has brought you a blessing in your future Bible readings. So thank you. Have a good night. God bless. Peace, love, and soul, brothers and sisters.